Let us worship God, turning in our Psalter to Psalm 145. We'll sing from the first version, verses 13 to the end of the psalm, which is verse 21 to the tune Effingham, number 56 in your split leaf Psalter. Here we have the word of the Lord concerning his kingdom and his reign. Thy kingdom shall forever stand, thy reign through ages all. God raiseth all that are bowed down, upholdeth all that fall. stand and look to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, 
We do bless your holy name. We praise you and thank you that your kingdom has no end, that it truly lasts forever. The kingdoms of this earth rise and fall under your hand, and yet your kingdom is everlasting to everlasting. Your rule is absolute. You are thrice holy, and we come into your throne room this your holy day to offer to you the praise and worship that is due to you, to your marvelous name, to your Son and Holy Spirit, Father. We pray that you would be with us in this worship, that you would, by your Holy Spirit, enable us to offer to you that worship that is a sweet-smelling savor unto you, that we would not be caught up in the form and fall into the ditch of formalism, but that we would sing to you the psalms from true and living hearts, that the words that we sing, we would uh, sing in a believing and not lacking faith, knowing that you will accomplish that which you have commanded. We thank you, Holy Father, that you have given to us one day from seven to rest from our earthly a servile work that is lawful those other six days, and to give ourselves wholly to the preaching of the word, to listening to the word preached and applying it to our hearts, to giving ourselves to those means of grace that you have given to your church to grow in Christ in her union and communion with you. We might not be found failing in these things, we do pray, Father. We pray that you would uphold us by your Holy Spirit. We pray also for those that may not know you, even this day, as they gather together, that your Holy Spirit would go out to those hearts. It would cultivate them and call and draw those that are yours unto yourself, that the gospel that is preached and goes forth would fall upon that good and cultivated soil and bring forth 30, 60, and a hundredfold of the fruit. Pray for those that would not care for the things of Christ, who come week after week and rebuff the word of the Lord, who forsake it as soon as it has been heard, who allow the cares of this world to choke it out, who allow temptations and strife to scorch it so that it may not bring forth fruit or root. We pray, Father, that you would be with those, those that are yours, that you would uh, afflict them and draw them unto yourself, but those that uh, do not know you and do not wish to, that you would bring these things in remembrance for them so that on the last day they would give an account for every message that they hear, every gospel presentation that is freely offered to them that they uh, cast away from themselves, and pray for those that have gathered together for your worship. They would strengthen us, be with those that are not able to uh, gather for your worship. We think of our brother Steve Irvin. We think of how you uh, preserved his life from that fall that he suffered. We thank you that you and your wisdom and counsel had provided a doctor that was uh, very skilled and knowledgeable concerning uh, dealing with his particular type of surgery that was necessary concerning the shattering of his hip and the pelvis. And pray that the work that was done would be healed in such a way that there would not be a great deal of scar tissue, that he would be raised up in strength. Give him this time when he is separated from us knowledge of the fact that uh, he is still able to worship in spirit, though not with us. Even those that are bedridden, that do uh, from afar uh, partake of the means of grace, though they are not part of the corporate worship, yet give unto them a blessing from uh, the word that they receive. Uh, they would apply it to their hearts, that you would cause them to grow in grace as a result. And we pray for those that have decided of their own sinful counsel to depart from the worship of God, to not see your day as holy, to desecrate it and to do their, own, their all, 
all the uh, desires of their own heart rather than the, the desires that you have placed upon us. We pray that you would afflict them this day. Help them to uh, have many things be brought to their attention to demonstrate that this is your day that is to be kept holy. And we pray that they might repent. Be with our nation that is in great need of repentance. The magistrates of the land that do not seek to uh, rule according to your holy law, rule according to your way, that do not kiss the sun. Instead, they rise up against him and cast off his bands. We pray, Father, that you would turn the hearts of the magistrates unto you. We do pray for their salvation as you have commanded us to do so in your word. We do pray for the advancement of your kingdom, that they would come trembling with their mirth, that they would come bringing tribute unto the sun, that they would suppress the wickedness found in the land, both in practice and in doctrine. We would cause them to be raised up to see the folly of their way in striving against Christ, in striving against the way of life. And pray, Holy Father, that you would raise up godly men to take their place if they will not kiss the Son, if they will not submit to you, even of our own children, that you would help us as we train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, that they would consider the calling that is placed before them, that they might consider how they may use their gifts and graces to the advancement of your kingdom. We pray that you would be with the ministers as they preach your word throughout the land and throughout the whole earth, those that have already begun their Sabbath day and have uh, engaged in public worship, those that do preach your gospel without mixture and error, and you'd strengthen them all the more and you'd cause them to uh, not fall at the darts of the evil one, that they would not stumble, but that you would raise them up. You would strengthen their feeble knees at times. You would cause them to preach with unction, that they would preach Christ and not their own words or their own thoughts, but that they would show forth the gospel unto the people, and that hearing the gospel, many would repent of their sins and turn unto you. You would cause the borders of your kingdom to go forth and extend outward, that she would fill up the entirety of the earth. We pray for the ingathering of the rest of the Gentiles and the repentance and return of the Jews to the church. We pray all these things in the blessedness of your son's name, our elder brother, in whom we find peace, our Lord Jesus Christ. To his name be the praise forever and ever. Amen. Let us respond to the Lord in Psalm. Turning together to Psalm 48. For those that are visiting with us, our middle two psalms are sing, sung consecutively. We come now to Psalm 48, verses 1 through 9, to the tune talus, which is number 138 in your split leaf psalter. Here we see the great proclamation of the prophet of the Lord to the people. The words of the Holy Spirit, which we are to sing, Great is the Lord, and greatly... He is to be praised still within the city of our God, upon his holy hill, singing to the Lord's glory and praise, Psalm 48, verses 1 through 9.
Please take your copy of God's Word for our Old Testament reading, turning to Joshua and the sixth chapter. Joshua chapter 6, hear the word of the Lord. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat. And the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, Take up the ark of the covenant, and let the seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said unto the people, Pass on, and compass the city, and let him that is armed pass on before the, Lord, the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass, when Joshua had spoken unto the people, that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of the ram's horns passed on before the Lord, and blew with the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. And the armed men went before the priests that blew the trumpets. And the rear reward came after the ark, and the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth, until the day I bid you shout. Then shall ye shout. And the ark of the Lord compassed the city, going about it once, and they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose up early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord, and the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the rear reward came after the ark of the Lord, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and returned into the camp. So did they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day, they rose early about the dawning of the day, and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time, when the priests blew the trumpet with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city, and the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein. To the Lord, only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are in, with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed. When ye take of the accursed thing, and make the camp of Israel curse and trouble it, but all the silver and gold and the vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpet. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him. And they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, 
Go into the harlot's house, and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath, as ye swear unto her. And the young men that were spies went in, brought out Rahab, and her father, and her mother, and her brethren, and all that she had. And they brought all, out all her kindred, and left them without the camp of Israel. And they burnt the city with fire, and all that was therein, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive, and her father's household, and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day, because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Accursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. Lord, bless the reading of his word. Let us respond to him in Psalm. Turning back to Psalm 48. Singing together verses 10 through 14 to Jackson, which is number 78 in your split leaf psalter. Psalm 10, Psalm 48, verse 10 to 14. And here it is by which we are strengthened to sing praise unto the Lord. O Lord, according to thy name, through all the earth's thy praise. And thy right hand, O Lord, is full of righteousness always. Reading in the New Testament, please take your copy of God's Word and turn to the book of Acts in the 13th chapter. Acts chapter 13. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up with 
Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now when Paul and his com company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up and beckoned with his hand and said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers, and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with a high arm brought he them out of it. And about the time of forty years suffered he their many manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed the seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that he gave unto them judges about the space of four hundred and fifty years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony, and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all mine will. This man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is this wor the word of this salvation sent. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. Though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him up from the dead. And he was seen many days of them 
which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give thee the sure mercies of David. Wherefore, he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Or David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers and wonder and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spank, spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldst be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the Lord, word of God, the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. And the Jew, but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city, and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them, and came to Iconium. The disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Please take your copy of God's Word at this time. To Psalm 58, the 58th Psalm as we consider this morning, the imprecatory Psalm of the King for his people, the imprecatory Psalm of the King for his people. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 58, to the chief musician, al Tasith, Mictum of David, do ye indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do ye judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? Yea, in heart ye work wickedness. Ye weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they, are bo they be born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ears which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of young lions, O Lord. 
Let them melt away as waters, which run continually. When he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows, let them be as cut in pieces. As a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away. Like the untimely birth of a woman, that they may not see the sun. Before your pots can feel the thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his blood in the his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that all a man shall say, Verily, there is a reward for the righteous. Verily, he is a God that judges the earth. It is a rather unenviable position to be in the court of law and find yourself in the place of the accused. Even if you are innocent, there is an opinion against you. Often the court of public opinion has already determined if you are guilty or innocent, regardless of the outcome of the court case itself. The courts of this earth are flawed. There is justice that is had from time to time, even as they judge righteously based on the word and law of God. And yet we often find ourselves seeking greater justice, seeking a truer form of justice. We can think even to the cases that have been had recently in our own nation, where one who wickedly engaged in human trafficking was found guilty on all but one point, and yet true justice will not be had because there will not be a systematic rounding up of everybody from president down to the garbage man that engaged in the work with this wicked woman. And so it is that justice at times is mixed on this earth. Nevertheless, there is a true judge above all that is our Lord and Savior. And he sits upon his throne judging all. And there will be a last day when all give an account to the Lord of the things done in their body, whether good or evil. There will be no escape, and there will be a righteous judgment that is executed. We come to Psalm 58. The particular genre of this psalm is highly misunderstood and often disregarded. The psalm that is before us is known as an imprecatory psalm. Now, you little children, the word imprecatory or to imprecate has the idea of cursing, to call down a curse upon someone. And at first blush, you may hear that and say to yourself, well, that doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound like the Christian should be cursing. But I tell you of a truth. We sing this psalm to the Lord's glory. And there is a lawful course cursing. So this morning, we will look particularly at Psalm 58 and the doctrine of imprecation, as the Holy Spirit in his wisdom has set it down for us in the scriptures and has for us it in Psalm 58 very clearly set forward. This afternoon we'll see also in part, generally, the doctrine of imprecation, but uh, more specifically, the word of God as it is wrestled by people to their own destruction, as many have done with imprecatory psalms, either misusing them or dismissing them all together. This psalm addresses the lawful undertaking of imprecation, takes the Christian into the very courtroom of the august majesty of God. We have him high and lifted up before us, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he has given us this psalm to understand this doctrine that we may be made more like into his image. The psalm itself, David breaks up into five parts. There are five parts to this psalm. First, the case for the imprecatory psalms. 
Second, the lawsuit for the imprecatory psalm. Third, the character witness for the imprecatory psalm. Fourth, the appeal for the imprecatory psalm. And fifth, the verdict for the imprecatory psalm. You notice that each of these are laid out in a logical fashion. And it is that the Holy Spirit has given to us one imprecatory psalm that walks us through the very courtroom of God and walks us through the nuts and bolts, if you will, of what an imprecation looks like, why it is lawful, and how it should be executed. Let's look first at the case for the imprecatory psalm. We find this in the superscript. David gives a fourfold case for the imprecatory psalm found in the superscript. Now, draw this to your attention. There are some things that um, I did not mention in 57 that I'll mention in this psalm. And there's a reason for that. That is uh, so that we may have a better understanding of the biblical basis of the imprecatory psalms and have a greater appreciation for it. And understand that as we go through an imprecatory psalm, it is very high legal language. It is very um, loaded with information, and it's easy to get lost in it. I am not giving you everything that came out of the study. I'm giving to you that which will be helpful for you to grow in grace, that which you will be able to use as you pray and sing the imprecatory psalms to the honor of Christ as king. The case for the imprecatory psalms. A, it is fitting for worship. We see this with the notation, to the chief musician, to the chief musician. We are given in 1 Chronicles 16, verse 7, this, nota- this word from the Spirit. Then on that day, David delivered this first psalm to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. David was a prophet. Asaph was a prophet as well. Asaph's name means gatherer or collector. And God, in his wisdom, now with the temple being laid, the foundation, the tabernacle being set aside, gave different duties and jobs to the Levites, to the various tribe, the various classes within the tribe of Levite. And what we have here is Asaph now being one that collects the psalms and delivers them for public worship. And so we see that the psalm itself is fitting for worship. We note also that it is indestructible. This is by the word al-tasith. Al-tasith. This word means do not destroy. Do not destroy. There are a number of psalms that bear this notation. Psalm 57 had it as well. And here we are shown what it is that will not be destroyed. It is the union and communion of the believer with Christ. These psalms are specially given to us. And if you have time, uh, later in the Sabbath, you can do a search on all the psalms that bear that title, Do Not Destroy. And you will see and note that the Psalms particularly speak to the union and communion that we have with Christ. How it is unbreakable. How it is unable to be assailed. Joshua chapter 1. I read it from Joshua 6. In chapter 1 verse 5, the Lord gives this promise to his prophet that leads the people into the promised land. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. This is quoted for us in Hebrews 13, 5. And we should not be covetous, but be content with the things that we have. For the Lord has said he will never leave us nor forsake us. The relationship that the believer has with his Christ is indestructible. There are many things in this world that can be destroyed. 
either by our own hands and our own folly or by the wickedness of others. You might have a vase that was handed down from your family from generation to generation, and you have it up on your mantle or somewhere. You point to it and say, that was great-great-grandmother's. And she got it when she was over across the Atlantic from her grandmother. You might have something precious like that. And how easy is it for a little one to come over and knock it in play and it be torn apart to smithereens? And you can try and piece it back together again, but if you're missing pieces, it's very obvious. The thing has been destroyed. It will not be returned back to its original estate. But, oh, believer, oh, brother, sister in Christ, the relationship that you have with the Son is indestructible. So that Paul, in Romans 8, begins and ends his section concerning that relationship with Christ and our adoption and saying, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he lists those many things and concludes it in verse 39. Nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's indestructible, it's inseparable, this relationship that we have. And these psalms are given to the people of God to note that indestructible, inseparable relationship. This is David making his case for this psalm. C, made of, a, of costly gold. It's made of costly gold. We note this by the word mictum. And again, I did not uh, mention a great deal of this in Psalm 57, but I want to draw this out to your attention. The mictum means gold. It's the word for gold. We have a number of mictum psalms. Psalm 16 is the first of them. And then we have this collection together of Psalm 56 to 60 of mictum psalms, of these golden psalms. Why is it that the Holy Spirit in his wisdom would give to us a psalm that is called golden, that raises it to a distinguished, distinguished level contrary to the other psalms. What is it about this psalm that makes it golden? Why is it called golden? Well, this is why. It speaks to our reign with Christ. And so 16 by being separated from 56 to 60, 16 is very much like a golden signet ring that the believer wears. And 56 to 60 being collected together is very much like a golden crown placed upon the believer's head. And so if we were to turn forward to Revelation, we see this reality of the believer and his relationship to Christ and how he reigns with Christ. Revelation 1, verses 3 to 6. Blessed is he that readeth at and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And again, in Revelation 5, we read these words. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them a harp, and golden vial full of the odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book that was opened, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tribe and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth." These are kingly psalms. These are golden psalms. And you, believer, as you walk through the earth, bear this golden crown on your head so that the world that is watching sees that you are different than the rest of them. You are not the same sort. 
Christ has raised you up to be kings and priests with him. Paul notes this in 1 Corinthians 6. The reason why we're not to bring brother and brother to the court of the Gentiles. He says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you not worthy to judge the smallest matters? So these golden psalms often speak of the judgment of God. Not all of them are imprecatory, but they speak of our kingship with Christ that we have because of that work that he has done on the cross. And David makes a case for the psalm that others would dismiss. They would take the golden crown off their head and cast it aside and say it's worthless. It's not worthy of the Christian. But, O oh believer, Christ has put that crown upon your head. Do not cast it off. Take hold of these psalms. D, it is originated by the Holy Spirit. We have it by the words of David. David is a prophet. We see this in 2 Peter 1.21, that holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. David has given the psalm by prophecy. The Spirit by David has given this psalm. It is in the inspired word of God. It does not contain the word of God. That there are some parts that we can pick and choose that we like and claim to be the word of God and others that we claim are not the word of God. That is not the case at all. The entirety of the psalm is the word of God. And the Holy Spirit would have you sing this psalm and pray this psalm to the Heavenly Father. The case being laid out before us, we now move to the lawsuit of the imprecatory psalm. The first verse, do ye indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do ye judge uprightly, O sons of men? Here we see David as a prophet coming to the church, and especially to those that are office bearers, and noting a lawsuit laid before them. There's a controversy that he has, much like Hosea 4.1. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. Because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. The imprecatory psalm comes by way of a controversy. And that controversy brings a lawsuit. Notice that David is not bringing this lawsuit to other earthly magistrates to mete out. David is not himself taking up the sword to mete out this lawsuit either. He is bringing this lawsuit to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And this is what's important for us to know. That as we pray, we're not praying to men, no mere man. We pray to Jesus who is fully God and fully man. We pray to the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit, by his aid. And so when we bring something like an imprecatory psalm, that is what we're doing. We're raising it to the Father. We're raising it to the Son. We're raising it to the Holy Spirit that they might act. The lawsuit that is laid out, David notes, a rhetorical question, do ye indeed speak righteousness, O congregation, do ye judge uprightly, ye sons of men? The answer is no. The answer is no. We can see this from the life of David. How often is David running from Saul? Saul is the king of Israel. And yet David is running from him. David's life isn't being hotly pursued that he might be blotted out from the face of the earth and the line of Messiah might be cut off. But it's not just Saul that is the issue. Those that are highly ranked as magistrates as well have joined Saul, either because of peer pressure or because they're looking to gain something from it. And they have joined in Saul's folly, and they too now are given this lawsuit. Think of the rash vow of Saul in 1 Samuel 14 where he said no man was to partake of eating until David was killed. Yet we see Jonathan, who did not hear the rash vow, 
who sees the honey dripping in the forest and eats it, his eyes are lightened, he's able all the more to fight for the Lord's cause and be strengthened by the honey. And then Saul tries to have him killed, despite how greatly Jonathan fought for the Lord's cause. And Saul's fighting against that cause. And it is at that time that we see some of the magistrates speaking against Saul and withholding his hand that he would not kill Jonathan. This lawsuit, like we see in many of the minor prophets, like we see in the major prophets, is brought before the church. Just as Christ himself brought a lawsuit before Jerusalem, David here brings a lawsuit that is necessary for the church. And this is the beginning of an imprecation. It is giving that reason for why such words should be spoken, that there's a controversy between a wicked person and Christ. David notes, you're not practicing lawful judgment and justice. Instead, you're entertaining a wicked man and enabling a murderer to run freely at his own pleasure against the crown rights of Christ. You see, David here in this lawsuit isn't bringing something that's petty and personal before the Lord. He's noting something that is an egregious action against Christ and his crown rights against his rule and reign. As we see in many court cases, after the indictment, the lawsuit is given, there are witnesses that are brought forth. And David brings the character witnesses from the, the his own people that are against him. He notes five things in verses 2 to 5 concerning the character of these people. They stand and give witness to the fact that their character is corrupt and wicked. Verses 2 through 5. Yea, in heart ye work wickedness. Yea, ye weigh violence in your hand in the earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born. Speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. He notes that the source of their wickedness is the heart. The wicked are strength, yea, in the heart ye work wickedness. It's interesting that this is the very first place that David begins because it is the hardest to prove. And yet Christ, whose eyes penetrate flesh and blood, can see the very soul of man, can see what is in your heart, in the very deepest recesses of it. David brings this out first. He brings his strongest argument that Christ would understand and brings it out forth and says, their heart is wicked. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So David notes the wickedness of their heart. And so it is with everybody that is against Christ. It's not because of something peripheral. It's not because of something external. It's something within their very heart. The very heart of man is wicked and deceitful. And the very heart of those men that stand against Christ is founded in wickedness. It seeks to work wickedness. It seeks to do violence to the Lord. The second witness is the outcome of their wickedness. See what he says in the second verse. Ye weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. David says the proof is in the pudding, if you will. He notes that the wickedness in their heart has taken outward form. And the trail of blood of the saints can be seen wherever they walk. How Saul, in his anger, killed all but one of the priests of God. And that blood trailed behind him wherever he walked. He was a bloody and deceitful man. He was a wicked man of blood. 
And so it is those that followed him. The outcome of their wickedness was violence throughout the earth. It's not peace, and yet you'll hear this, will you not? You may have worldlings that you work with. You have uh, pagans that you're um, working beside. And they'll have this different understanding of peace. And their peace is off, all, their peace is always violent. Right? It, it's not about toleration. It's about suppressing truth. It's not about peace. It's about their consciences being seared and not hearing the truth, not letting it prick them anymore. And what is the response? It's violence. We didn't get the ruling that we liked in the court. We're going to overthrow and burn a city. We didn't like the way that someone looked at us. We'll key their car. And on and on the examples could go. It's not one of peace. It's not the peace of the gospel that we bring as believers in Christ. Notice that is your duty. As you bring the gospel, you bring terms of peace. These men and women are dead set against Christ. They're ready to commit suicide by plunging themselves into his sword. And we stand giving the gospel, bringing forth the evangelistic unction to give terms of peace to those that would not have peace. Just as we, you might remember, a time before you were a believer, especially if you received Christ at an older age, and you can consider the wickedness in your own heart and how desperately you fought against Christ in his kingdom in your sin. And yet what happened? The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ came to you. Terms of peace were given. And the violence of your hands was changed to peace. You were a peace breaker and then you were made a peace maker in the Lord's righteousness. But the wicked, not so. The outcome is always violence. See, the nature of this wickedness, the nature of this wickedness, original sin in their hearts, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born. Speaking lies. The nature of of their wickedness, the estrangement from the womb. Now, David is bringing this imprecatory psalm, and some of those that are attacking him are covenant children. And this is the cruel reality that is given to us, that those that apostatize, those that are covenant children that are raised up and apart from Christ, seek their own way, are often the most violent ones against Christ and his kingdom. But David notes that they were estranged from the womb. They received the waters of baptism, but it did not profit because it was not wed with faith. And so it is, you, you covenant children. Every man, woman, boy and girl here that has been baptized. You must consider this. Are you like these wicked ones that David is bringing this lawsuit against? that he's bringing this impregnation against. You look at your own heart and does it bear witness against you that you are estranged from the womb, that you have not kissed the son, that you have not submit to the rule of Christ, that you have not repented of your sins and taken hold of Christ in his gospel and closed with him. And yet this very morning, the gospel is being preached to you. You saw the very long recitation of the gospel by Paul to the Jews. And you see how they rebuffed against the gospel once they saw they were not getting the favor of outward things, that it was someone else, it was Christ. You see, these were the same that is addressed in this psalm. They were estranged from the womb. D, the volatility of their wickedness under the, Christ, the um, character witness that is given, the volatility. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear. The poison is like the poison of a serpent. This is the volatility of their wickedness. 
Wicked are not there to be your friend. They're not there to treat you nicely. They're there to seek your very end. And so it is here that David brings this illustration to our eyes. You perhaps have played with a dog, your own pet. Sometimes the dog gets too playful and nips at you. This is not what's going on here. David is talking about a serpent that is seeking to kill that which it bites. It sinks its fangs in for the purpose of killing. It's not peaceful. It's not harmless. It's very harmful. It's very volatile. It seeks the destruction of the person that it bites. And so are these wicked men. And David, or Christ notes this, quoting David, and Paul notes this as well, that there's poison under their tongue. It's not the wisdom that comes from above that is first pure and then peaceable. Not, enough, not at all. It's impure and it's warring. It's warring to see all devastation. E, the last of the witnesses that David brings forth, the irredeemable nature of the wickedness. And this is important for us that as we sing these imprecatory psalms, as we bring them forth to the Lord, David notes their irredeemable nature. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers charming, never so wisely. You might have seen, um, perhaps on a video, perhaps even live, some form in the Middle East where they're able to charm snakes, as it were. And so a cobra will be in a basket, and someone will have a loot, and the cobra will start to dance upward. David notes that they are not charmable. The very word of God has come to them again and again, and they are not able to be put under the power of the gospel. They're irredeemable. And something like this should have struck if Saul heard this psalm, or those that were with him in attendance in his courtroom should have heard this psalm heard what David said and struck them in the heart, that they're like a deaf adder that doesn't hear the charmer. 1 Samuel 16, as well as 18 and 19, David is called upon to come and play the harp and prophesy to Saul. An unclean spirit is given to Saul. The first time, the unclean spirit goes away. The other two times, Saul is not seduced, as it were, by the harp of David. He will not listen to the word of God. He will not listen to the prophecy of the gospel and tries to kill David by throwing his javelin at him. And so it is that everyone that hears the gospel and refuses to obey it, they're like the adder that has stopped its ears and will not listen to the charmer. Our Lord noted something similar, similarly in Matthew 11. He speaks to the people there concerning the nature of his ministry versus John the Baptist's ministry in Matthew 11. He says, What shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you and you have not danced. We have mourned unto you and ye have not lamented. Here we see the wicked trying to seduce and control the, word, the very word of God by their charms. But here in Psalm 58, the wicked will not be put in submission with the word of God. They stop their ears. Is that you this morning? You hear the very word of God preached unto you. And your first response is, I'll, I'll look and listen with, with intrigue and see if there's something new that I can go ahead and play with. And then when you're pricked in your conscience, the first thing you do is cover your ears. Maybe not physically, but spiritually speaking, you stop to listen to the preaching of the gospel. 
you stop to listen to the doctrine that is being set forth. Is that you this morning? If it is, you have much to repent over. You need to ask the Lord to give you ears that will hear and a heart of repentance that will obey his word as it is said and not be like the deaf adder. It's customary in a trial when all has been said concerning the case, when the prosecution and the defense rests and the verdict is about to be read, that at times, especially in very heinous crimes, where much injury has been done to a surviving party, the judge will look to that party and ask them, What would you have me to do with this person? If you were in the place of the judge and you were able to give judgment, what would you have to be done? Would it be the death penalty? Would it be 30 years in prison? What is it that you would ask of me? And the King of kings and Lord of lords comes to David and does the very same thing. He says to David, okay, I see this case. They are guilty. They are guilty beyond measure. What do you call upon to be done? What is the appeal for the imprecatory psalm given here now? What appeal do you give, David? It's interesting to note that in the appeals that David gives in 6 through 8, that there there were five of the witnesses. But these things that are brought forth are not rash and vengeful from the heart of David. In fact, they match the very thing that was committed against Christ and his kingdom. We should consider well. When we sin against the Lord, he will often discipline us in like manner of that sin. There is a lex telianus that is had at times that the Lord has set in nature that often people misunderstand. And David comes with this appeal. He says, they're wicked. They will not repent. Let these five things come upon them in the appeal. A, remove their source of power and influence. Remove their source of power and influence. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of young lions, O Lord. In Psalm 57, Verse 4, David noted these teeth as well. He said, My soul is among lions, and I, eat, I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. 57, he mentions the teeth. He mentions how hostile they are. Now in 58, as the appeal is given, what should the censure be? What should the verdict of judgment be? What should the sentence be against these people? The very first thing that David says is break their teeth. Punch out the mouth of these lions. Remove their source of power and influence. And think about that. A a lion is a great creature. But if you take his claws out and his teeth out, what's the worst that it could do? Maybe smother you to death by laying on you like a large cat. But David here is asking the Lord, In his appeal, in the judgment that is given, Lord, remove their source of power and influence. People come to the imprecatory psalms, and they see this list that David gives of what he's asking God to do. And they think that this is a laundry list of vengeance. David has a vendetta. David has a heart problem. That is not the case at all, beloved. They've sinned greatly against Christ and his crown rights. And I dare say the things that David are asking is actually too small. Because it's not against David that has been sinned. It's against Christ that has been sinned. It's his honor that has been dismissed and sullied. And David is saying, advance your kingdom by way of this form of judgment. This is how they abuse their authority. Take that authority away. A, the removal of their source, of their power and influence. B, 
swift and sure removal, the first part of 7a. Let them melt away as waters which run continually. We've had a lot of rain lately in the upstate. Now maybe you have some things in place. Maybe you've planted tulips for the next year for spring already. You did it before the frost. And because of all this rain, you find the tulip bulbs now above ground. Or you've had some structure in your backyard that you worked on. Maybe you have a chicken coop or something else like that. And because of the rain, it just wiped it away. We see this often with mudslides. Very powerful avalanches of rain coming and just demolishing things very quickly in very strong fashion. You can't stand up against it. And this is what David is saying. He's asking that the judgment be swift and sure. He's not wanting it to be delayed. He's saying, let them melt away as waters which run continually. It was there standing, and now it's gone. We see this as well in Psalm 109, verses 14 and 15. Let the iniquity of the, his fathers be remembered with the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually. They may be cut off the memory of them from the earth. Removal of the foundation, the very memory to be removed. You see, the wicked in the earth desire that of the righteous. How often have we heard the last few years of statue after statue of Robert E. Lee being removed, his godly heritage being settled, uh, shuttled away because of slavery and a misunderstanding of things regarding it. But they'll remove that and they'll erect a statue of a murderer, a drug addict, an adulterer. You see the difference here. The wicked would have the name of the godly removed. David is asking that the Lord remove their name and do it swiftly. We see in Proverbs 10, 7, these words, The memory of the just is a blessing, but the name of the wicked shall rot. And so it is that every society that tolerates wickedness rots from the inside out. Every single one of them. And we can look back to the nations of Canaan, which the children of Israel were commissioned to go in and displace because that was their land. We're told that the very earth was spewing them out. Look at our own country. Has the church been the salt and light that she is to be to them? Has she been a preserving that which is around? No. In many cases, she has engaged in the same corruption and rotted away. See, upsetting and preventing future assaults by them. David thinks towards the future. They sought to destroy the future of the righteous. And David now says, when he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows, let them be as cut in pieces. The wicked, when they're judged by God, will often take time out to regather and reassemble their forces if they're not utterly destroyed. David knows this. He's seen it happen before. And we've seen it as well in our own nation. A David here, so that the kingdom of Christ would not be upset and thwarted, asks that their wicked ways be upset and prevented before the assault even happened. And so he asks the Lord that before they, as they bend the bow, and shoot the arrows that it would be as if they were cut in pieces. We see this similarly in Psalm 37. Here David notes the following. The wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth his day coming. The wicked have drawn out his sword 
and bent their bows to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as are of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart and their bows shall be broken. David speaks very matter-of-factly of the judgment of God. Here he asks the Lord to remove those bows, to break them. You see, the wicked are not the only ones that have bows and arrows. The righteous do as well. And so we sing in Psalm 127, verses 3 to 5. Thy wife, oh, sorry. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of the mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. The only thing worse than having um, wicked children is to have many wicked children. You see this in the world. You see this in parents that do not catechize their children, even those of the church that raise them up. How hostile they are to the things of the gospel. How very um, lazy they are to extending the kingdom of Christ. God has given to us children for the purpose of striking against the wicked. The wicked are striking against us with their arrows, and we are to strike back. So do not be negligent of the duty that God has given to you to raise up a godly seed, to catechize your children, to speak to them as you walk along the way. You can think of this. How often are you given opportunities to address things of the Lord with your children and you dismiss it because you're in the middle of a movie or watching a game or the like or because it's going to take too much out of your time? David is asking for their arrows to be broken ahead of time. We need to make sure that we are strengthening our arrows for that future assault against the kingdom of darkness. D, give them the desire of their heart. As a snail which melteth like every one of them pass away, like the untimely birth of a woman, that they may not see the sun. Give them the desire of their heart. A snail that melts away. David here gives an illustration that uh, you children especially might find fond or that you know of. Where you might see a snail or a slug on the sidewalk and you put a little salt on it and what happens? It um, dehydrates and it shrivels up. And David's noting the same thing here. The desire of the heart of these people was when they sit under the light of the word of God was not to be moistened by it, not to be sustained by it, but to refuse it. So like a slug or a snail, they shrivel up under the light of the sun. Or the very salt of the covenant that they've been given, that it speaks against them. And instead of preserving them, instead of making them savory, it destroys them. That's true of the covenant sign and seal of baptism. There's not just blessings that are given, but curses as well. If you are not obedient to the covenant, God will bring the curses upon you. And so David here uh, asks the Lord, give them the desire of their heart. They don't want the things of Christ, give that to them. Give the things contrary to Christ in fullness and destroy them. Fifth, or E, Remove the covenant protections from them. This is a very hard illustration that David gives. Like the untimely birth of a woman, that they may not see the sun. The womb is a place of protection for children. We have a culture that seeks to destroy that at every turn. At any chance, if a woman does not want the child, she can go and murder the child in her womb. And David notes this protection. He says... Make them like a woman of untimely birth. Make them like that child of untimely birth and that they may not see the sun. That covenant protection that's given to them. They're in the visible church. They have the external privileges given to them under Christ. They have no saving reality of it. 
They're not in the invisible church. They have no desire for such things. And David is now calling for their excommunication. For them to be removed from the circumcision role, as it were. This is a serious thing. This is not something that we should take lightly. But this is what David is saying. David is noting, remove those covenant protections. The babe is protected in the womb. But what happens in untimely birth? Miscarriage or stillbirth. And they are still born in the faith. They may have historic faith, but they do not have a saving and justifying faith. They come out dead, unprotected. And so it is that David speaks here. But again, with these harsh words, remember, this is what David is saying in the imprecation. Give unto them according to their sins. Give unto them according to as they have assaulted Christ, his blessings, and his crown rights. Lastly, the verdict of the court, the sanctity of it. David notes the sure decree in verse 9. Behold, for your pots can feel the thorns. He shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. David here looks forward to the last day. He notes that there will be an end and a judgment given unto them that will be rendered. David notes something that may seem odd to you. If you have ever been out camping and try and put together a fire, you know how disruptive too much wind can be. It keeps you from being able to make the fire. It blows out the fire that's just started. And this is what David notes, that those parts that you have as, as, uh, to kindle the fire, the oils of the thorns, that God in his decree of judgment, his verdict, will be so swift, he will wipe you away before those thorns even pop like a whirlwind in his wrath. Both the living, it says, and in his wrath. It points forward to the last day. That Christ will come back to receive his bride. And he will come as a thief in the night. Many unprepared for him. And he will take the living and the dead and will establish the great white throne and judge all accordingly. There's a surety to this decree and the verdict that is given. There's sincere gratitude that ought to be given as well. Verse 10 and 11, The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that a man shall say, Verily there is a reward for the righteous. Verily he is a God that judgeth in the earth. The sincere gratitude in verse 10. Grace and mercy has been extended to the righteous. What do we make of the language that's here? It's the language of worship. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. And we're not rejoicing over the death of the wicked. We're commanded not to do that. We're also commanded to be careful when God brings judgment upon the wicked to not rejoice lest he takes away that judgment and exalts them back again. The rejoicing that is happening here is not like you see on the playground where one petty, wicked child is pointing at another one and saying, nah, 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 nah. That's not what's going on here. The rejoicing is because Christ has triumphed and he has triumphed magnificently over the wicked. He is a man that has come to the war and the battlefield and is now victorious. That is why David uses this language that for some seems very odd and very bloody. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. Well, some looking at that without understanding the rest of the scripture would see that as pretty vile. But that is not what is 
happening here. It's not some weird bloodbath that is occurring. Revelation 19, verse 11 to 16. And I saw opened, behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called Faithful and True. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in, with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, and white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. What does it mean that the righteous shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked? This is what is done at the end of the battle. The king goes through the field to collect his spoils, and there are pools of blood all over. You're literally washing your feet in the blood of the wicked. This is the image that is given to us. We have a very uh, sanitized culture, a very divorced culture from understanding of warfare. Even in the generation that we have today, um, it's not like the warfare of times past. Where is hand-to-hand combat? And now you can send a drone strike and destroy the entire army with the press of a button, leveling it. But hand-to-hand combat with sword in hand, gun to gun, the very ground pools with blood. And here is Christ, standing victorious, in white and on a white horse. And we with him that know him and have put our trust in him, coming behind him. We wash our feet in the blood of the wicked. Why? Because Christ has triumphed. Lastly, the sanctity of the Lord's rule and judgment vindicated in verse 11. So that a man shall say, Verily there is a reward for the righteous. Verily he is a God that judgeth in the earth. This brings us full circle to the beginning of the imprecation. The very reason why we ought to sing and pray imprecatory psalms. See, the offenses that David is bringing up is not petty personal offenses. You little children might have this in the house where your brother or sister will hit you or punch you or steal something from you. You might be at work and you you might have been through this scenario where someone steals your lunch. You go to your lunch break to retrieve your lunch box and it's gone. And somebody's stolen and eaten your lunch. This is not what we pray in precatory prayers for. Not personal petty things. We pray them as they have to do with the very rule and judgment of Christ. As he, his name, his kingdom is assaulted. This is why we pray in precatory psalms. This is why we sing in precatory psalms. This is why it's fitting not just for the older administration of the covenant of grace, but for the new one as well. Because he still reigns. He's still conquering all of his and our enemies. He's placing them under his footstool. He is sanctifying his rule. And so it is that every time that we sing these psalms from a true heart, we are bringing to remembrance the rule and reign of Christ over the wicked over the kingdom of Satan, over every earthly power that would raise themselves in contradistinction to Christ. This is why we are to sing and pray the imprecatory psalms. I hope that as you have seen in Psalm 58, how David has laid out the case for you, how he's brought forth the lawsuit and the witnesses, the appeal, and finally the verdict. You will be able... All the more, as you see these imprecatory psalms in the Psalter, as you come across them, not 
sing them uh, sheepishly, but sing them with boldness for Christ and his kingdom that is going forth, for his crown rights, and for the glory of the gospel as it goes forth. Let us stand and look to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many different types of psalms that you have given to your church to sing. We thank you that they have come by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. These are not the words of some mere men with a vendetta, men that are in sin, but you have told us by your word that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so as we sing these holy and golden psalms, help us to remember the rule of Christ and his reign. Help us to submit unto that gospel that you have given to your people and to improve upon our baptisms. We pray this in the name of your blessed Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us sing to the Lord's praise from Psalm 18. Turning to Psalm 18. This is a psalm penned by David after the Lord gave him peace from all his enemies and Saul. We'll sing verses 6 through 10 of the psalm to Magnus, which is number 119 in your split leaf psalter, knowing that as we sing these imprecatory psalms, we can also call upon God for aid. As David says, In my distress I called on God, cried to my God did I. He from his holy temple heard my voice, to his ears came my cry. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. 
Amen.